Side 3. On February 19, 1994, a mystery worthy of the X-Files began in Riverside, California, where Gloria Ramirez was admitted to hospital. Only 31 years old, Ramirez was dying. Though she was known to have cervical cancer, her symptoms were atypical. Difficult breathing, low blood pressure, and dementia. Treating the symptoms while trying to locate the source of the woman's sudden deterioration, the trauma staff began with a standard range of drugs that they hoped would stabilize her condition. When she failed to respond, the staff took more drastic action, and the peculiar nature of the case became evident. As Ramirez's heartbeat faltered and staff tore at her clothes to apply shock paddles, they discovered an oil that covered most of her body. Her breath, when the airbag was removed from her mouth, vaguely smelled of fruit, or perhaps garlic. The blood drawn from her arm contained pale flakes of something, and it reeked of chemicals. Before long, a similar odor rose from her body. When a nurse leaned forward to identify the source of the smell, and continued to fall forward onto Ramirez's chest, she became the first to succumb to the mysterious forces at work inside Gloria Ramirez. In the first hour of Ramirez's treatment, three more staff members collapsed. Eight others developed lesser but equally disturbing symptoms, tremors and spasms, severe eye irritation, and even partial paralysis assailed those trying to save Ramirez's life. When Ramirez died an hour later, no one knew any more about what had killed her than they had when she was brought in. Something mysterious had knocked out most of a well-seasoned trauma staff. If the staff later appeared defensive to investigators, they had good reason. Simply put, no one believed their version of events. When they described the ammonia sent from the blood, it was suggested that methane, swamp gas, might have seeped up from a sewer. When they pointed to their colleagues, some of whom were hospitalized for weeks after the incident, they were forced to defend themselves against charges of mass hysteria. Their tale of toxic blood and gases caught the public's imagination, but only undermined their reputation among their colleagues. While the public was content to speculate over coffee, the hospital staff wanted answers. They were slow in coming. The samples a moon-suited autopsy team removed from the Ramirez body would pass through many hands before even the thinnest theory was developed. Even now there are those who can't believe that Gloria Ramirez's body had produced its own version of nerve gas. The human body, everything within the fragile covering of the skin, is a delicate ecosystem where organs and systems exist discreetly. The pH of the stomach, ranging anywhere from 2 to 4, is equal to that of hydrochloric acid, which would literally eat away any other part of the body. In Ramirez's case, that neatly compartmentalized system broke down, and her body became the flask for an exotic chemical cocktail that included codeine, Tylenol, lidocaine, Tygon, and the toxic materials employed in chemotherapy. Even that combination mightn't have killed her without the addition of a trio of odd chemicals, which eventually gave researchers the clues they needed. While all the agents involved in Ramirez's official treatment had been accounted for, there remained the folk remedies that she had resorted to in desperation. She had rubbed into her skin a gel used by athletes containing dimethyl sulfoxide. This resulted in the oily substance the staff had noticed. With the addition of oxygen from her face mask, the dimethyl sulfoxide formed dimethyl sulfone that broke down in the cooling body to dimethyl sulfate. Nerve gas. The strange case of Gloria Ramirez eventually had a rational explanation and provided a curious parallel with X-File 124051394, codename the Erlenmeyer Flask, which aired before the mystery was solved. But it's not the only X-File that has had weird echoes in the natural world. In X-File 10811-0593, codename ICE, Scully and Mulder make a trip to the frozen north to see why a team of scientists, still high from a record-breaking drill into the Arctic ice, should suddenly have started slaughtering one another. It quickly becomes apparent that the first thing to have died was trust. With a pathogen loose among the scientists that is capable of inducing a killing frenzy, all the agents have to depend on is one another, if they are who they think they are. 
Though the real ice-drilling projects haven't turned up any parasite with a taste for human adrenaline, the ice fields do have life. More life than was ever thought possible. In the Antarctic and oxygen-starved lakes right in the ice sheet, microbial organisms flourish. Algae have been found in both hemispheres, growing through the ice, invading every crack and crevice. The green and brown stains indicate algal strands miles long and capable of creating high-oxygen environments within ice. Nor is life restricted to the microscopic. In large numbers, a pack of ice borers can be terrifying. They were first discovered by April Pazzo, who was observing penguins along the Ross Sea. As she was about to head back to camp, the penguin suddenly screamed and stampeded past her, clearly terrified. Looking around for a large predator and finding none, Ms. Pazzo attempted to retrieve the only penguin of the flock who hadn't fled. Startled doesn't quite describe her reaction on discovering the bird had sunk into a circle of slush. Slush just doesn't exist in the Antarctic at that time of year. But heat was actually rising from around the floundering bird. Grabbing the bird to keep it from sinking further, she heaved until it came free and discovered a new animal. Clinging to the bird were a dozen hairless creatures with their teeth sunk deep into its flesh. Almost as soon as they were tugged free of the ice, they released their grip, and it was all Pazzo could do to capture one of the savage six-inch-long creatures that she described as repulsive. The others tunneled down through the slush. Since that surprising first encounter, April Pazzo has made it her business to observe the creatures she dubbed hot-headed, hairless ice borers. Full-grown specimens don't seem to exceed six inches in length, and even the largest weighs only a few ounces. Size alone wouldn't make them any more dangerous than a particularly nasty mouse, but the ice borers, while related to rodents, have some pretty unique adaptations that make them perfectly comfortable in their Antarctic ice burrows. With an incredibly high metabolic rate, the ice borer's normal body temperature is 110 degrees Fahrenheit, much of that heat is apparently released through a bony plate on the forehead that is suffused with so many blood vessels that it shines a brilliant red. This natural hot plate not only accounts for the slush pit that suddenly opened under the penguin, but also for ice borer's speed. Over a period of several months, Pazzo discovered that the mole-like creatures could tunnel faster than a penguin could waddle, and nearly as fast as a human in cold weather gear could jog. Once underneath a colony of penguins, the ice borers congregate on a single victim and surge up through the ice and snow. Suddenly finding itself in a puddle, the penguin is trapped and begins sinking. The ice borers, who seem to be 90% teeth, slice through the unlucky bird in a matter of moments. Pazzo has seen them leave nothing behind but webbed feet and beak, and they've been known to attack even the four-foot-tall emperor penguin. Creatures like the ice borer, now suspected of having been responsible for the disappearance of explorer Philippe Poisson, remind us that truth can be stranger than, and as terrifying, as fiction. Luckily for those working and living in the high Arctic on projects like the Greenland Ice Sheet Project, the ice borer seems confined to the southern hemisphere. High atop the world, they're discovering some amazing things about our own history buried in the ice— the Ice Sheet Archive in Greenland was created as snow fell year after year, trapping the gases, chemicals, and dust of the atmosphere, and eventually being compressed into ice. The study of the archive has yielded some interesting results, and one of the more curious theories supported by it is the meteorite footprint theory. In 1908, an asteroid plummeted into the atmosphere over Siberia's Tunguska River region. Exploding with an estimated energy of 15 megatons, flattening trees for hundreds of square miles, and leaving a recognizable meteoric signature in the form of deposits of iridium. Preliminary studies of two shallow ice cores have shown the same signature in Greenland's ice, indicating more meteoric activity. With the theory appearing solid, the teams were able to turn to the possible long-term effects of the impact. In the short term, the effects were catastrophic. Over time, however... The minerals in the meteorite might actually have seeded the area with elements that enabled the growth of new plants. Of no small consideration was the energy generated by the impact, energy that didn't just dissipate into thin air. Across the Siberian site are pockets of verdant growth, a condition scientists are ready to attribute to the force of a rock slamming into an ice sheet. 
Perhaps the notion of new life arising in the midst of freezing cold isn't so far-fetched after all. In X-File 209-111894, codename Firewalker, Agent Scully and Mulder faced the opposite conundrum. Could life exist in a volcano? Most people's swift response would be a resounding no. By combining the smallest nuggets of scientific information, though, the X-Crew makes us reconsider that response. It does exist. Just not in the way we usually imagine. In 1977, an American deep-sea research ship was investigating underwater volcanoes erupting from a ridge south of the Galapagos Islands. Three kilometers below the surface of the ocean, they found vents on the sea floor that were spouting hot, chemically rich water into the sea. In these jets and in the crevices of the rocks around the vents, the scientists discovered great concentrations of bacteria consuming the chemicals. The bacteria, in turn, were being fed upon by immense worms, three to five meters long and up to ten centimeters in circumference. They were unlike any other worms previously encountered by science, for they had neither mouth nor gut, and they fed by absorbing the bacteria through the thin skin of feathery tentacles, rich in blood vessels that sprouted from their tip. Since these organisms live in the black depths of the ocean, they are unable to tap the energy of sunlight directly, nor can the worms obtain energy secondhand from the falling fragments of dead animals drifting down from above. Remember, they have no mouths. Their food comes entirely from the bacteria that derive their sustenance from the volcanic waters. Indeed, the worms may well be the only large animals anywhere that draw their energy entirely from volcanoes, which then would form the base of a complex food web. Alongside the worms lay huge clams, 30 centimeters long, that also fed on the bacteria. Rising jets of hot water created other currents that flowed towards the vents across the seafloor, bringing with them organic fragments that are eaten by other organisms, strange, hitherto unknown fish, and blind white crabs clustering around the clams and the worms. So in these submarine volcanic springs, a dense and varied colony of creatures flourished in the darkness. Nor is the phenomenon completely foreign to terrestrial environments. Hot springs dot much of the Earth's surface. The water they produce, which originates partly from sources far below and partly from rainwater that is permeated deep into the ground, has been heated by a lava chamber and forced back up through cracks in the rocks. Water accumulates in small subterranean chambers, becoming superheated under pressure until finally it flashes into steam and spouts to the surface as a geyser. In other cases, the upward flow is regular, slower, gentler, and the water forms a deep, perpetually brimming pool. Even in these scalding waters, bacteria flourish, and along with them are more advanced organisms like blue-green algae. The algae add an important element to the system, chlorophyll, the nearly magical substance that enables plants to use the energy of the sun to convert chemical substances into living tissue. Such organisms are found in the hot springs of Yellowstone Park in North America, there, the algae and bacteria grow together to form slimy green or brown mats. Nothing else is known to survive in the hottest parts of the pools occupied by these mats. But where the pools spill over, the water cools the few degrees necessary for other creatures to live. The algal mats provide a rich source of food that is eaten voraciously by everything from brine flies to raccoons. Could the silicone-based life form Mulder theorizes in Firewalker actually exist somewhere in the universe? There are two schools of thought on that, and they're not mutually exclusive. Those who speculate that life needn't be based on carbon, as Earth life is, are usually found eyeing the periodic table of the elements because the table group elements by their properties, their similarities. For example, carbon and silicon both sit happily in column 4A because they react similarly with other elements, share the same number of valence electrons, and form compounds that react alike. By combining carbon and oxygen during human respiration, a compound carbon dioxide is formed. Theoretically, at least, a silicone-based organism could go through its own version of respiration and produce silicon dioxide, a compound that does indeed exist. We call it silica, sand, and it is the material found inside the victims in Firewalker.
The problem, according to the other camp, isn't the metabolic processes, but the ability to form long molecules like DNA from silicon. Attempts to create long silicon-based chains haven't been successful, and without those huge molecules, silicon life would be limited to the simplest of organisms. But then again, how complex are fungi? In X-File 112-121793, codename FIRE, combustion of a more prosaic kind is on Mulder's mind as he attempts to resolve both his stormy relationship with British police inspector Phoebe Green and a lingering childhood fear of fire. While Mulder's fear of fire is one many of us share, how much more frightening must it be to have a first-hand run-in with spontaneous combustion, a phenomenon suggesting that people can burst into flames for no apparent reason. Few known cases of spontaneous human combustion have been carefully recorded. Aside from satisfying the more macabre side of human nature, there's an understandable desire to comprehend and prevent such events. If one person can suddenly burst into flames without cause, why not another? Why not you? Or me? Though there are only a handful of documented cases, consistent circumstances link them easily. The most notable features of SHC are the lack of a fire source, the almost total combustion of flesh and bone that leaves only extremities undamaged, localized burning limited to the victim and his or her chair, sometimes leaving clothing undamaged. The concentration of occurrences, usually indoors or in cars, suggests that the phenomenon may be in some way related to enclosed spaces, although it has also happened outdoors. The most famous case is, unfortunately, only famous because of the media attention devoted to it, and not because it's the best example of SHC. Mrs. Mary Reese of Floridian was last seen alive at about nine in the evening, after crawling into her pajamas and her favorite housecoat and curling up in an easy chair. When her landlady left, Mrs. Reese was enjoying a before-bed cigarette. The following morning, eleven hours later, the landlady returned to deliver a telegram only to find the doorknob hot. Alarmed, she called to two nearby painters, and with them entered the apartment. A wooden beam had caught fire, but there was no sign of the tenant. Firemen were called in to deal with the beam, and in the process, discovered a pile of ash, a foot in a slipper, a charred liver attached to a piece of vertebrae, and a shrunken skull as small and hard as a baseball. Mrs. Reese's cozy chair and everything else in a well-demarcated circle four feet in diameter was gone. Plastic items in the proximity had melted, but fabrics equally close hadn't burned. A pile of newspapers at the edge of the circle hadn't even singed. On entering the apartment, even experienced firefighters had failed to catch the faintest wisp of burned flesh, a near-impossible odor to get rid of in an open space, much less in a closed apartment. No trace of combustible chemicals was ever found, and investigators had difficulty believing such destructions could arise from a single cigarette. Media organizations had a hard time believing it, too, and were soon airing stories about the latest case of spontaneous human combustion. The media, however, are seldom the final arbitrator of truth, and two forensic investigators continued delving into the case. Though they disagreed on minor points, the analysts declared the death both accidental and explainable. They determined that Mrs. Reese, drowsy after her usual nightly sedative, dropped her cigarette, ignited her rayon housecoat, and was overcome before she could react. As the fire took hold, her body fat melted and helped fuel the flames, the candle effect. A film of grease covered the floor around the few remains of the body. The main point left to be addressed, which might determine if this were an SHC case or a particularly unfortunate series of events, was whether a cigarette fire, even one driven by rayon and body fat, could account for the complete charring of the body. One doctor who'd observed bodies in crematoriums at over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit had seen recognizable bones eight hours later. Others confirmed that bones left at lower temperatures for the 11 hours specified in this case could indeed be reduced to ash. Mrs. Reese's case, after investigation, was relegated to the unfortunate but not unusual file. It did, however, serve to alert the public to SHC and resulted in other unusual cases being investigated as they were reported. A truly bizarre case is that of Billy Thomas Peterson, who was apparently dead when he caught fire. 
A Peterson had earlier gone out to his garage, closed the door, turned on the engine, and quietly committed suicide. When found, Peterson's body was badly burned. A religious statue attached to the car's dashboard had melted, but nothing else was affected. His clothes, even his underwear, were completely undamaged. His body hair, unsinged, protruded through the crisped skin, and his fringe hung across a cracked forehead. While other objects have been said to spontaneously combust and are being investigated along with the cases of SHC, our devotion to the macabre makes it unlikely that those object-related cases will supplant human combustion in the minds of the media or average people. Average people had little to do with the strange cult that Scully and Mulder caught up with in X-File 11401219419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419419
A dog whose acute sense of smell we've co-opted for our own use is ten times as likely as we are to eat tainted meat. Pain endings are more widely distributed among the nasal cavities of humans than olfactory receptors. Well, ask anyone who's been punched in the nose. And those nerves are exquisitely capable of reacting to even mild irritants like orange oils. Strong irritants, like ammonia, produce responses active enough to rouse the semi-conscious. If humans are so sensitive, even if the rest of the animal kingdom might term us differently abled, how do we manage to avoid being in a constant state of pain? By adaptation. Humans adapt to odors, basically ignoring them on all practical levels. How we do it is still a question, but people who enter a slaughterhouse and immediately begin gagging can, within an hour, tune out the scent. Oddly, the adaptation rate rises with the strength of the odor. The scent of something burning on the stove will remain with us twenty times longer than the smell of the slaughterhouse. The fact that humans classify tastes like tart and sweet isn't news. Most people agree that lemons are sour, sugar is sweet, and cloves are bitter. One item will elicit the same taste response from the vast majority of people. What is new is that we do the same thing with odors. Because wintergreen and eucalyptus, for example, fall within the same odor category for the majority of people, we can sniff wintergreen until it fails to invoke a scent response, until we tune it out, and then be completely unable to smell the new scent of eucalyptus. This new understanding of the human sense of smell has prompted the recent study of our response to pheromones. Could we smell pheromones and produce them as well? Yes, on both counts. With hindsight, the signs were always there. Perfumeries have long included musk, which is literally a pheromone, in their products. That females become incredibly sensitive to musk-like odors around the time of ovulation is a strong indication that human males must either currently or at some point in our past development, produce a musky pheromone. Once the evidence was gathered supporting human reaction to pheromones, some studies were begun to find the human pheromones. Their existence may soon be able to explain love at first sight. Back with the gender benders, Mulder and Scully were discovering something that's old news to most biologists. In fact, a number of species have the ability to adjust at will either their own sex or that of their offspring. Even among human beings, the genetic potential for either sex is present for a considerable time after conception, and most embryos go through a phase where both sexes are at least partially expressed. The ability to change sex as adults, however, isn't among our usual talents. Some of the species that can change sex at will, or at least in response to environmental factors, are guppies, who respond to population pressures. Certain frogs who begin tadpole life as one sex, but finish it as the opposite. And several of the larger amphibians of South America, who appear to express both sexes into adulthood, and then adopt the sex of the most needed gender. Social insects like ants or bees usually produce offspring of a particular sex, or no sex at all, by flooding their environments with a sex-specific pheromone, or by feeding them specific foods like royal jelly. What was truly extraordinary about gender benders kindred was their ability not only to switch genders, but to shift back and forth. Only a few of the Earth species have ever been suspected of shifting more than once per lifetime, and even their capabilities have yet to be confirmed. More natural phenomena caught the attention of agents Mulder and Scully when they investigated people disappearing in the woods of Washington State in X-File 12004-1594, codename Darkness Falls. When a local logging company points fingers at an active eco-terrorist group in the area, both Mulder and Scully think it's a big junk from spiking a tree to murder. And Scully doesn't put much weight in a local's theory of what sounds like swarming, intelligent killer fireflies. Well, they might not be killers, but strange things are at work in the woods. Fireflies, the very ordinary bugs we caught in jars as kids, are doing something absolutely extraordinary. Anyone who's ever stared up through the branches of their backyard trees knows that each firefly has its own rhythm, its own beat. Flash, 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 or maybe flash, flash, flash flash, flash. 
If any two flashed in unison, it was briefly interesting, if only because you knew it wouldn't happen again. Like watching stars twinkle, half the intrigue of fireflies is their unpredictability. So when reports started coming out of Tennessee about not just two or three synchronous fireflies, but acres of them, etymologists' ears perked up quickly. Deep in the Great Smoky Mountains, a light show was warming up. The eerie sight had become almost old hat to generations of the Faust family, whose cabin sits seemingly in the center of the rhythmic insects. In addition to the regular flashes, they'd even seen a ripple of flashes run down the mountainside. And these bugs do more than just flash together. They also stop flashing together. It's not a simple continuous pattern, but a complex combination of responses that would be closer to language-styled communication than signaling, if not for the automatic aspect of the reply. The Faust fireflies are not alone. On the other side of the world in Southeast Asia, throughout the firefly breeding season, trees are observed flashing as though they were decked out for Christmas. After reading an article about the well-known Asian insects, Lynn Faust wrote a letter that caught the attention of ethnologist Grant Copeland, who recorded the activity with video cameras. While he hasn't figured out yet why bugs on two different sides of the world just happen to have decided to form light orchestras, he does have some basic starting points. Fireflies, it's generally thought, achieve synchrony in much the same way that a crowd of people clap in unison at a baseball game. If you begin to clap by yourself, you pick up a tempo of your own. But as you hear others clapping, you adjust the interval of your claps so that your next one will be closer to theirs. A synchronous firefly flashes rhythmically if it is alone. The rhythm, researchers believe, is an involuntary response, a biological means of completing a sensory circuit. If you imitate a firefly by flashing a light in the first insect's eye, its rhythm will slowly adjust until it matches your light. So what could explain the fact that these two groups of fireflies appear to be gifted with a pre-programmed beat? Well, researchers in the field believe that the joint flashing among male fireflies is a means of attracting females who might be confused by the presence of other firefly species. Rather than risk a female passing all of them by, they cooperate to create a larger light signature. Once they've caught the female's attention, it's every insect for himself. Which is fascinating, but it doesn't address the problem of how in this episode some itsy-bitsy little mites managed to get at least one of the husky woodsmen in this episode, manly men at the height of their manliness, according to Mulder, all the way up a tree. But think of it this way. When Scully pointed out when she unwrapped the woodsman, the body was thoroughly desiccated, completely dried out, and it's surprising just how light a human body is once its fluids are removed. If these mites were as effective as some, they could have sucked out as much as 80% of the logger's weight. Even a man of, say, 200 pounds becomes a lot more manageable once he's been turned into a dried husk of less than 50 pounds. Even so, for an insect that weighs less than a grain of rice, 50 pounds might seem like a mountain. But the fact that these deadly little creatures were deadly, glowing little creatures opens the door to a whole different scenario because bioluminescence allows a bunch of individuals to work together. With that in mind, we no longer have just one glowing insect trying to lift a husky logger into a tree. We have thousands. The final key to the mystery is the most obviously frightening aspect of the mites' activities, the way they cocoon their victims. If you assume the logger's body wasn't lifted into the tree until it was relieved of most of its fluids, that numerous bugs were working together to do the lifting, and that mites, like spiders, have silk that shrinks, the whole thing begins to come together, and we can put aside the image of a full-grown man being lifted off his feet by tiny insects. With their victim on the ground, the mites could have rather easily drained him of fluids, wrapped him in strands of silk that would naturally start the lifting process as it dried, and then pulled the body the remaining distance. Not as outlandish as the X-Files solution, but perhaps more incredible for being possible. Fear of insects is not something X-File agents can afford, as was graphically illustrated in X-File 22204-2895, codename F. Emasculata, in which Mulder and Scully are sent on a manhunt for two inmates who have escaped from a prison where a highly contagious disease has broken out. 
The crowded conditions in most prisons make them unavoidably prime hosts for modern plagues, like the fictional F. emasculata disease in this episode, and the deadly Ebola virus of Zaire. Ebola is one of a whole group of diseases known as viral hemorrhagic fevers, and easily carried by insects. One of the most frightening things about Ebola is that there's still no firm knowledge of its natural host. But though its origins remain unknown, the progression and symptoms of Ebola have been well documented. A first step to early detection. All forms of viral hemorrhagic fever begin with an elevated temperature and aching muscles, much like the common flu. Depending on the particular virus, the disease quickly progresses until the patient develops respiratory problems, severe bleeding, kidney problems, and shock, none of which can be confused with the symptoms of the viral flu. The severity of viral hemorrhagic fever can range from a relatively mild illness to death. Discovered in Zaire in 1976, Ebola was named for a major river in the area. Until mid-1995, only three outbreaks of the disease had ever been reported among humans. The 1995 outbreak supports the theory that Ebola is most deadly in crowded conditions, like prisons and hospitals. The first victim appears to have been a surgical patient at a local hospital. Once diagnosed, medical teams from other areas of Zaire, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the World Health Organization, were parachuted in and a full quarantine was declared. Less than a month later, the disease had been largely contained. As in F. emasculata, the most important part of the containment process is obtaining a confirmed diagnosis and isolating all infected or possibly infected individuals. While Scully had to sit with a cockroach taped to her arm for half an hour, Ebola requires much less exotic tests. Diagnosis is by detection of Ebola antigens, antibodies, or genetic material and no burrowing larvae are involved. <laughs> Sexual, intense, dangerous, powerful. The vampire legend tempts human imagination with a lure of the forbidden sweet promises of immortality and the thrill of power. That legend, as any exophile knows, also falls squarely within the realm of an exophile. In X-File 207110494, codename 3, Mulder and Scully delved into a tantalizing fringe element of the club scene, the vampire subculture, and encountered a chilling story and an unholy trinity of characters. In the darker shadows of nearly every club scene are people for whom the trappings of vampirism have become the ideal. At night they indulge a love of gothically styled clothes, sip dark red wine, and exchange long, languid looks with their lovers. Then they go home, put out the garbage, and find work clothes for the following morning. At least the vast majority of them do. Some few, very few, unable or unwilling to disentangle themselves from their nightly fantasy, follow a different path. They exchange love nips as others exchange kisses, include the taste of blood on their list of sensual delights, shun the sunlit hours, and truly come to believe. It's not hard to understand the appeal of vampires. While details differ, near-heroic attributes are always part of the package. Physical strength, mental dexterity, incredible senses of smell, hearing, and sight make human beings appear puny by comparison. The ability to fly, shapeshift, control the minds of animals and humans, or call fog from a clear night, are certainly beyond our scope, but it's the vampire's tendency to see humans as food that has made their names anathema throughout the centuries. Fortunately, their tremendous strengths have always been balanced, at least in myth, by equally striking vulnerabilities. The Hing Si, a Chinese vampire with poisonous breath, in addition to the usual phalanx of supernatural abilities, should in theory rule the night. Not so. Should the hunting Hing Si happen across a pile of rice, it's compelled to stop, break off its hunt, and count every grain before it can pass. While it's counting, it's easy prey for normal weapons or ordinary sunlight. Perhaps the most traditional way to permanently dispose of a vampire is to hang it in the sun for a few minutes, but there's more to that than meets the eye. Dracula, the most famous vampire, only gradually gained an aversion to daylight in film and television. 
In the original 1937 film, Dracula, like many others of his ilk, found light uncomfortable but hardly a lethal impediment. Early guides for the vampire hunters stressed belief above alchemy, faith above science, a theme that resonates through all the X-Files, not just this episode where a vampire who'd been killed by exposure to sun later walks through it without harm. In fact, this episode's climactic scene takes place not in a foggy, damp night scene adjacent to sewers or tunnels or cemeteries, but in a brilliantly lit home without a wisp of fog to be seen. Belief plays a large role in other methods of vampiric execution, whether by crosses or holy water, though it's never clear whose belief is being tested. Is it the vampire's belief, or the wielder's that makes these weapons so potent in popular literature? Would the Hing see perhaps a Confucian in its previous life fear such a weapon? If it is the wielder's faith at issue in this contest, why would any symbol be necessary? Of course, less esoteric means of killing or escaping from vampires do exist. A stake through the heart of ash, maple, or hawthorn is held to be nearly universally effective, as is decapitation with a gravedigger's shovel, drowning in salt water, or burning. Then again, few ordinary mortals could survive that sort of treatment either. For nearly 300 years, Eastern Europeans practiced preventative medicine that was concerned with warding off vampirism and lycanthropy in addition to the diseases of the day. In fact, in A.D. 909, one brother Constantine of Bavaria painstakingly compiled the definitive list of vampire medications, a list of some 110 items. It was no simple task to avoid becoming a vampire, and death was one of the most common ways this transformation took place. There was a right way and a wrong way to die. Sick relatives were often confined to their beds long before it was physically necessary, simply to keep them from doing anything that could make them a vampire, including dying excommunicate, dying unbaptized, dying apostate, dying while recovering from being a werewolf, dying while under curse from one's parents, dying by suicide. The sick were often bound and gagged to prevent them from taking their own lives to end the misery of their illness, or dying in a fall from the left side of one's wagon. If you were unfortunate enough to die under any of these circumstances, your family would have to sit watching you until you were well rotted and thus safe to bury. But even if you took pains to avoid vampirism at death, such a fate was, for some, unavoidable. Signs of eventual vampirism were detectable at birth and include the following being born with a tooth already erupted, being born with red hair, being born the seventh son of a seventh son, being born the child of a mother who'd slept with demons, or being born with a placenta still over one's head. Finally, if you turned out all right at birth and knew what to avoid doing at the end of your days, you had a pretty good chance of avoiding the wrong kind of eternal life. Between birth and death, you simply had to avoid the following, being promiscuous, unknowingly drinking the blood of a vampire, and being bitten by a vampire. Vampires exist in many traditions. Among the more exotic are the Asenbosam of Africa, which have hooked feet and prefer the victim's thumb to neck. The Malaysian Bajang, which often appears as polecats. The Scottish Banshee, who appears as a beautiful young woman and dances with young men until they become too weak to put up a fight. The Mediterranean Empusa and the Bulgarian Kervapiats, which are noted for their one nostril. A plausible explanation for the vampire myth was suggested in 1985 by David Dolphin when he dubbed Porphyria an unusual genetic condition that interferes with the metabolism of iron. Vampire's disease. Some porphyria patients certainly exhibit strange and eclectic symptoms, including extreme sensitivity to light, heavy growth of body hair, severe anemia, and congenital defects of the face and fingers, with several patients possessing the pointed ears traditionally associated with devils, demons, and vampires. But porphyrics have no cravings to drink blood, human or otherwise and fail to exhibit an aversion to holy symbols, garlic, or any of the traditional banes. 
Afterlife weirdness of a different sort dogged Scully and Mulder in X-File 215020395, code name Fresh Bones, as they grappled with claims of military brutality, voodoo curses, and zombie soldiers rising from their graves at a camp for Haitian refugees in Norfolk, Virginia. Separating truth from reality becomes increasingly difficult as the agents themselves were drawn into the imprisoned Haitians' imported culture and experienced Haiti's magic for themselves. On April 30th, 1962, Clarvius Narcisse arrived at Haiti's famous Albert Schweitzer Hospital. On May 2nd, two experienced doctors signed his death certificate and expressed their condolences to his sister. After identifying the body, Marie Narcisse added her thumbprint to that certificate. The body was stored on ice overnight and was released the next day to Marie and younger sister Angeline for burial. As is customary on many tropical islands, services were almost immediate, in this case within eight hours. Friends and relations grieved and ten days later covered the grave with a slab marker. In 1980, Clavius Narcisse, very much alive, walked into his family home. Even in mysterious Haiti, his return caused an uproar. The Narcisse case, unlike dozens of similar incidents reported and ignored each year, came with a solid medical record, Scotland Yard's approval on a fingerprint comparison, and the Narcisse family's testimony. Clavius's return from death was the first case documented in ways non-Haitians could understand, and that was one reason it became of great interest to an investigator, Wade Davis and the zombie project he started in 1982. The zombie had stepped from Haiti's mystical past through the sensationalism of film and popular fiction and into the sterile arena of modern medicine. Unfortunately, though Narcisse was alive, the zombification process remained a mystery, and the complex society producing zombies remained closed and misunderstood by outsiders. The zombie project study team began its work by reviewing the existent zombie research, Within days, serious recording problems came to light. A few paintings, verbal folklore, and a scant number of testimonials written in as told-to format by non-Haitians was the extent of traditional reference material. Wading through a hodgepodge of information, Davis couldn't help wondering if it was gathered for the denigration of Haitians instead of for practical study. With few exceptions, non-natives preferred tales of decapitated chickens and voodoo dolls to the richer cultural tapestry of religion, music, folklore, and art that might provide a real historic context for zombification. In fact, the most intense research done in Haiti was by Hollywood, hardly a solid, unbiased starting point, and one which gave us walking mummies, chicken shakers, and crones sticking pins in dolls. Nowhere in the B-movies and dime-store novels was Haiti's incredible history revealed. Wade Davis's zombie project began with a commitment to tackle zombification without prejudging its culture. It brought together talented chemists, doctors, art historians, and artists, even theologians, all willing to view Haiti from a Haitian's viewpoint, or at least acknowledge zombification as but one part of a diverse way of life. In this eclectic academic arena, ethnobiology, a field that merged pharmacology, botany, biology, and anthropology, was the science that built bridges between these disparate fields of knowledge. In some way, Davis's approach was standard scientific procedure. Describe the problem, develop a hypothesis, identify variables, test, evaluate, and if necessary, begin again. However, in one crucial way, his work was unique. Davis asked more than how zombies were created, or what drug combinations might explain the phenomena. He asked why. The discovery process began with an acknowledgement unusual for scientists, that Bokor, or priests, respected members of Haitian society, were experts whose assistance had an intrinsic monetary value. Rather than assume the Bokor must submit to researchers' questions, the researchers held some right to study valuable products gratis, or that any Bokor needed an opportunity to justify his profession, Davis, like locals, negotiated for the items and information he needed. As he observed the lengthy zombification process, moved among residents and reported to the rest of the team, he absorbed the context of each part of the ritual, as well as the techniques involved. Many aspects of the process, and of the Narcisse case in particular, were troubling. 
from the Narcisse family, and Clervius came hence, that Clervius had brought his death upon himself, and instead of celebrating his return, his family barely tolerated him. Davis had to suspect Clervius's crime related to his family life, and discovered that in a society where sexual freedoms and responsibilities are clearly defined, Clervius had impregnated five women and refused to acknowledge their children. Attempts by the women's families to negotiate a settlement were rebuffed. His response was intolerable, a disgrace to a family already smarting under his antisocial behavior. Clervius's brother, who under Haitian law co-owned the family farm, was refused a family loan without reason. Clervius's personal home was one of a dozen in a family compound, but the only one re-roofed. He had his hand on the family income and refused to distribute it, even to feed his own children or improve the farm. Desperate, the family appealed to the Hungan to impress upon Clervius the damage his greed brought the entire group. But Clervius continued to ignore any needs but his own, while his children lived under another's roof, their mothers shamed by his action. He spent family money when and where he chose. Products from his farm were shunned in the market. Still, he did nothing. Eventually, under Davis's prodding, Clervius admitted to receiving warning visits from the Hungan. His societal transgressions had been enumerated. He'd been given a chance to respond to the accusations made against him, and with his likely punishment fully articulated, Clervius was given three years to address his crimes. Instead, he became only more tyrannical. When he fell ill and suspected that his long-delayed judgment had been imposed, he appealed to the Hungan for an antidote. The Hungan couldn't have found a reason to delay judgment even if he'd wanted to. Narcisse's entrance into the Schweitzer Hospital was his last effort to avoid a punishment richly deserved under his own culture's laws. To Haitians, the creation of a zombie requires more than the right combination of ingredients. While the herbs, powders, and ritual are important, it's the strength of the individual Bokor and his connection to spirit that determined the power of his zombie powders and antidotes. At a careful distance from human habitation, the Bokor directs the amounts and conditions of various components while invoking the spirit. If he has been successful, then the victim soon dies, and even the most talented physician would be hard-pressed to distinguish the newly made zombie from a real cadaver. Some ingredients of a Bokor's zombie powder are intended to protect the voodinist, or ensure physical delivery of the powder to the victim's system. Colored talcs create protective patterns on the floor around the ritual area. Powdered glass, coated thorns, or the spiny stem of the raspberry cane are just a few ways powders can be introduced into the victims. Here are some sample ingredients. Pufferfish, containing the powerful sedative tetrodotoxin, sun-dried whole for two to five days and ground into a fine powder. Toads or lizards, in the absence of puffer, can be used. However, as toads produce less powerful results, they're confined in a jar overnight with a sea worm to bring out their essence. In the morning, toad and worm are killed, sun-dried, and ground. Gunpowder, dried gallbladders of mules, or men. Plants, some of which have tiny hairs which provoke itching and allow the tetrodotoxin to gain access, and human remains, preferably fresh, retrieved from graveyards and reburied at the practitioner's home for forty-eight hours. Skin anointed with herbal oils is dried and ground. Bones are scraped on graters or pounded into dust with mortar and pestle. The body part of a child is considered more potent as it brings birth and death, the living and dead, closer together. There are two equally probable theories as to how the victims are revived. For one, most medicinal ingredients, whether in poisons or cures, remain active in the body for a fixed time. In places where swift burial is a health concern, a bokor could be reasonably sure the body would be in the ground when the powder wore off, in twelve to twenty-four hours. The other theory, supported by the jars of liquid often found in open coffins, suggests an antidote as part of the revivification. Antidotes, like zombie powders, are often unique to single practitioners and locales, and though the ingredients differ, some consistent rules seem to govern their production. Ideally, an antidote is made at the same time as the poison it's meant to counteract. 
Unlike powder preparation, where a hungan or bokor may direct activity without actually handling the physical elements, antidote production is a personal, hands-on activity. The ritual preparation and use of antidotes takes place in public view within the community's temple, often involving the participation of several spiritual leaders. The poisoning of a victim is normally handled by secretive societies. All antidotes are aromatic. Common ingredients include mothballs, ammonia, and perfumes. The purpose of an antidote isn't to revive the dead. Instead, antidotes protect those who might be exposed to zombification, like the Hungan's aides and victims who haven't yet died. A newly made zombie extracted from its grave seldom fully recovers from the experience. The theory that the brain areas most sensitive to the oxygen deprivation of underground confinement include those governing personality and thought is supported, but fails to explain zombies who awaken from their lassitude when the bokor dies. Finally, unlike poisons with their chemically identifiable ingredients, antidotes appear to be pharmacologically inert. While there is evidence that pH-specific treatments, including ammonia, could denature tetrodotoxin, the Voodinist claim is that only the bokor's power and the spirit working through him is the real active ingredient. Reincarnation, transmigration, and metempsychosis all describe the religious or philosophical rebirth of the soul, the essence of a human being in one or more successive lives. Depending on tradition, those lives may be limited to another human being, or include animals and even plants. In some religions, including Vudan and several Carib faiths, belief in multiple souls is common. The philosophy is as follows. There is one aspect of the soul unique to each individual that returns to a greater being, and a second part that belongs to a greater cosmic soul and is reborn into the next generation. The soul is frequently viewed as capable of leaving the body through the mouth or nostril, and of being reborn as a bird, for example, or a butterfly. The Venda of Southern Africa believe that when a person dies, the soul stays near the grave for a short time, and then seeks a new resting place, or another body, human, other mammalian, or reptilian. Some priests have the job of watching over the body to ensure that no creature or person is available to be the receptacle for its newly freed soul. Among the ancient Greeks, a belief called Orphism held that a pre-existent soul survived bodily death and was later reincarnated in a human or other mammalian body, eventually receiving release from the cycle of birth and death and regaining its former pure state. Plato believed in an immortal soul that participates in frequent incarnations. The major religions that hold a belief in reincarnation, however, are the Asian religions, especially Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism, all of which arose in India. They hold in common a doctrine of karma, results of an act, the law of cause and effect, which states that what one does in this present life will have its effect in the next life. In Hinduism, the process of birth and rebirth, transmigration of souls, is endless until one achieves moksha, or salvation, by realizing the truth that liberates, that the individual soul, Atman, and the absolute soul, Brahman, are one. Thus, one can escape from the wheel of birth and rebirth, samsara. Jainism, reflecting a belief in an absolute soul, holds that karma is affected in its density by the deeds that a person does. Thus, the burden of the old karma is added to the new karma that is acquired during the next existence until the soul frees itself by religious disciplines, especially by the practice of ahimsa, non-violence, and rises to the place of liberated souls at the top of the universe. Although Buddhism denies the existence of an unchanging, substantial soul, it holds to a belief in the transmigration of the karma of souls a complex of psychophysical elements and states changing from moment to moment after death the soul with its five skandhas group of elements ceases to exist but the karma of the deceased survives and becomes a viyana germ of consciousness in the womb of the mother this viyana is that aspect of the soul reincarnated in a new individual 
By gaining a state of complete passiveness through discipline and meditation, one can leave the wheel of birth and rebirth and achieve nirvana, the state of the extinction of desires. Sikhism teaches a doctrine of reincarnation based on the Hindu view, but in addition holds that, after the last judgment, souls that have been reincarnated in several existences will be absorbed by God. An unusual diet turned Mulder's mind to reincarnation of a different sort in X-File 22405-1295, codename Our Town. But surely cannibalism isn't common in Arkansas. Well, maybe not, but it gave the scriptwriters something to get their teeth into as they trawled the anthropology textbooks for information about flesh-eating in New Guinea. New Guinea is the second largest island in the world, and one of the most sparsely populated a fact some attribute to its history of cannibalism. Cannibalism has been acknowledged by all three of the island's large tribal groups, the Papuans, the Melanesians, and the Pygmies. Contrary to early theories, however, cannibalism was more likely to be associated with war than with religion or dietary preferences. War in New Guinea was a highly ritualistic practice tied to the supernatural world of spirits. Guerrilla tactics were never used until formal notification of the intent to make war was delivered. Attacks on women and children were strictly taboo among most tribes. Holy men and women were required to be present for any major skirmish to ensure that none of the rules of the engagement were broken. And perhaps most importantly, when an enemy was killed, his soul had to be accounted for immediately. To leave even an enemy wandering the supernatural world was unconscionable. It was this last rule, and the Papuans' method of ensuring that the spirit didn't wander, that led to cannibalism. The spirit was considered a material object, part of which permeated the body, another part of which was tied to the material soul, but not tied to the real world until the material soul was destroyed. As might be expected, the destruction of the material soul was tied to the destruction of the body. The Papuans believed there was a limited amount of material soul, that their people would die out if the soul were liberated and unavailable to the next generation. So the soul must be returned to the tribe in some way. That way, at least in the case of war casualties, which were considered unnatural deaths, was by ingestion. Cannibalism. Well, religion has many faces, and voodoo and cannibalism aren't the only belief systems that lay siege to Mulder and Scully's sanity. In X-File 21401-2795, codenamed De Hand de Verletz, ritualistic murder brings them to a small town where frogs fall and water runs backwards on a daily basis. The falling frogs is old hat to meteorologists. As long ago as 1666, a priest in the English county of Kent reported, About Easter in a pasture field in this parish, which is a considerable distance from the sea or any branch of it, and a place where there are no fish ponds but a scarcity of water, was scattered over with small fish, in quantity about a bushel, supposed to have been rained down from a cloud, there having been at that time a great tempest of thunder, hail, wind, etc. These fish were about the size of a man's little finger, and were shown publicly in Maidstone and Dartford. Similar records meticulously maintained indicate that although fish are the most common creatures raining down on the countryside, they're by no means the only species. A Bournemouth youth reported in 1891, One day we had a violent thunderstorm. Having no shelter, I was wet to the skin in a few minutes and saw small yellow frogs about the size of a florin or half-crown dashed on the ground all around me. I ran to shelter under a larger mortar pan, and after the storm was over, found in this pan hundreds of these small frogs. Thousands were impaled on the firs bushes on the common close by. Even birds, supposedly at home in the air, have fallen out of it en masse. On the night of March 13, 1904, some 750,000 long spurs fell within a few square miles of Minnesota. So many blackbirds fell over Shreveport in 1941 that military police were called to assist in removing them. A soldier reported whole flocks just plopping to the ground. Mollusks have fallen in France. A full-grown salamander nearly 11 inches long fell in Nashville, Tennessee. And live lizards showered Montreal in 1857. 
The residents of Guam were stunned to have a European freshwater fish scattered over their island. But strange as all these events must have been, the oddest case of all belongs to Dubuque, Iowa, where, after a violent hailstorm, ice pellets melted to reveal tiny, still-living frogs. Naturally, such events draw attention, including the attention of scientists who, like Agent Scully, immediately put aside any suggestion of supernatural causes. In many cases, the theory of tornadoes or water spouts scooping the creatures up and hurling them to the ground was easily accepted. As in the cases above, the vast majority of these falls are connected to violent weather. Witnesses frequently gave descriptions similar to that of a Dutch man who saw a water spout form, then retract into a low-level cloud that, to the accompaniment of several loud detonations, flew apart, dumped a huge quantity of water and fish all over the town. Well, many scientists are reluctant to close the book on these incidents. Frogs live in densely inhabited environments shared by insects, fish, birds, and snails, not to mention plants, small stones, mud, and other detritus. Lakes seldom contain a single type of fish, yet in only a handful of cases have more than one type of creature been dropped at any location. In August 1894, residents of Bath were pelted by thousands of jellyfish, but not a single scaled fish. To further compound the case, all these jellyfish were, within fractions of an inch, the same size. As no smaller or larger species were found anywhere in the surrounding area, an argument for size separation by centrifugal action is difficult to support. Another puzzling aspect is the condition of the specimens found. Fish are, without question, water breathers, but live specimens are often found deposited miles from the nearest source of water. A five-and-a-half-pound turtle, unarguably heavier than many of the stones, plants, or other creatures in its usual vicinity, crashes through a window unaccompanied by any of those other objects. Jellyfish, with their delicate tissues, fall uninjured, while sand eels, frozen solid, shatter on impact with the ground. Last, and perhaps most curious of all, are those rare cases when, without any visible sign of unusual weather, thousands of specimens fall from clear skies. On October 23, 1947, an employee of the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, considered an impeccable observer of this particular type of phenomenon, submitted a report that challenged even the accepted conventions of a fish fall. Thousands of fish, totaling several tons, and covering an area of 75 to 80 feet wide and over a thousand feet long, fell in gardens, atop roofs, even in cisterns, and all from a clear, if misty, sky. No unusual weather fronts were reported within a hundred mile radius. No rain fell in association with the event. No thunderclaps or other anomalous noises were reported. The fish, like the toads in De Hunt de Verlets, simply fell. Fish falls and witchcraft marry to astonishing effect in this episode. But as Mulder is quick to tell Scully, Wicca has nothing in common with demon worship, or the cultist they're hunting down. A modern interpretation of early pagan religions, Wicca is an earth religion, and Wiccans, also known as witches or practitioners of the craft, are well known for their reverence of the earth. In general, Wiccans revere both the male and the female, and believe that human will, properly directed, can have tangible results. Wiccans are a subset of pagans, though they define pagans as country dwellers, not as those without religion. They have a creed, the Wiccan reed, by which most members abide. In a much shortened version, the reed states, An arm at none, do what thou wilt. The interpretation of what can cause harm is for the Wiccan to contemplate, and Wiccans are expected to expend a considerable amount of time arriving at a set of personal ethics, rather than simply accepting those enforceable by law. When Wiccans form congregations, also called covens, they are usually small groups. Wiccans take a personal interest in the welfare of each group member. The guiding force for Wiccans, whether as part of a coven or individually, is usually the charge of the goddess. All acts of love and pleasure are my rituals. There is also a charge of the god, but it tends to vary between covens. 
In X-File 2200-33195, code name Humbug, a retirement community for circus performers is terrorized by the mythical Fiji mermaid, which like to eat its victims and leave fin marks instead of footprints. As Scully and Mulder try to separate truth from fantasy in a town populated by tattooed men, bearded ladies, and people who routinely retract their testicles into their bodies and hammer nails into their noses, the paranormal might seem almost mundane. The Figi mermaid, which plays such a prominent part in this episode, was perhaps the most often shown of the dozens of fake mermaids floating about Europe during the 1800s. The exhibit started its European tour as the East Indian Mermaid at the Turf Coffee House in St. James, England, and it attracted thousands of visitors, even after it was revealed as nothing more than an arrangement of monkey and salmon it was still capable of bringing in the visitors. By contrast, the Siamese twins Chang and Ang Bunker were a genuine curiosity in the 19th century. Born joined at the waist in Meklong, Siam in May 1811, Chang and Ang became so famous that all other conjoined twins, regardless of nationality, have until recently been called Siamese twins. While they were still just boys, Chang and Ang attained the status of celebrities in their homeland and were invited to be the guests of the King of Siam. However, as people started coming from all over to see them, it didn't take long for someone to realize that visitors would likely pay for the privilege. In 1829, when circuses worldwide were in their heyday, Chang and Ang left Siam with a British agent and embarked on a tour that took them from Canada to Cuba and into almost every country in Europe. While their earnings as miners went to their agent, on turning 21, the pair decided to take their affairs into their own hands and began to arrange tours to suit themselves. In a remarkably short time, they had amassed a small fortune and bought a plantation complete with slaves in Mount Airy, North Carolina. When they became naturalized citizens of the United States, they took on the surname Bunker and shortly thereafter married sisters Adelaide and Sarah Yates. While they ran the Mount Airy property together, the brothers maintained separate homes about three miles apart. They alternated houses on a three-day basis to spend time with their wives and many children. Throughout their lives, separation surgery had been one possibility suggested to the brothers. They had decided against it. There was a small risk attached to the procedure, and the men considered themselves well adapted to their circumstances. They could run, swim, hunt and their family situation was stable. Though they were attached by a band of skin around their waists, there was no sharing of organs, and most important, no blurring of their distinct personalities. They were complete both as a unit and as individuals. The brothers died in 1874, just three hours apart. Some suggest that Aang died of fright on waking up beside his dead brother, but there's no proof to support the theory. The truth is out there, all right, and it's often stranger than fiction. When students found an unusual skull in Chaco Valley, the ancestral land of the Anasazi Indians, they were shocked to identify the huge eye sockets, almost indiscernible nasal cavities, and diminutive mouth familiar from the vast majority of drawings of aliens made by abductees. Could it have been, was it proof that aliens really exist? that the Anasazi really did have a deep connection to an alien species friendly to humans, as their name, which means ancient aliens in Navajo, suggests? Or did the skull come from a child suffering from an unusual congenital bone defect called oxycephaly? More likely. But still, the truth is out there.